Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Leighton Woodhouse. Leighton is a freelance journalist and documentary filmmaker, and he writes a Substack at LeightonWoodhouse.substack.com. It's called Social Studies, and I'll link to it in the episode description. It's a Substack that I subscribe to that I read quite often. Leighton's a really good writer. He writes about a variety of contemporary social issues, and he has a background in sociology. So he writes about various things that are going on in our society and analyzes you know, what's going on, why it's happening the way it's happening, and where things might go. He's really good at writing with clarity and putting things things in historical context, bringing in a lot of ideas from sociological thinkers, uh, past and present, and using some of those ideas to try and make sense of what's going on today. We talked about a variety of contemporary subjects. One of them was the homelessness and drug addiction epidemic that's been growing and spreading in America for some time. We discussed why, why that is an issue, where it's coming from, and why our governments at the local level can't seem to deal with it, um, why the problem gets worse despite so many resources being poured into solving it. We talked about things like nonprofit organizations, which are ostensibly there to solve these problems, but often end up perpetuating them. And we talked about why that is. We spent some time talking about ideology and religion, the the role that religion plays in society and how certain ideologies evolve and how they allow people to rationalize their actions and, and get attached to certain ideas in order to justify why they act in a certain way. We talked about things like college education and how that has evolved over the years. We talked about the concept of elites in society, people that wield either economic power or cultural power and, and what that actually means. And, and the concept of overproduction of elites, which is something I've discussed on the podcast before, the idea that there comes times in societies where you produce too many people who feel that they should be entitled to elite status. And when you overproduce those people, you produce more of them than there are actual slots to hold them. It can have a destabilizing effect on society. We talked about sociological thinkers like Emile Durkheim and some of the concepts that they've used to try and understand societal dynamics. We talked about things like the institution of science, how science is actually conducted in practice, um, what the incentives are, are driving what scientists do and, and why they do it, and how things like science and things like ideology and things like religious concepts are often co-opted and used by people in certain in certain social strata to you know justify their place in society and try and uh, steer the culture one way or the other. And a lot of our discussion really just centered on this this notion that you know we may be in a state of civilizational decline. That in many ways the standard of living has been declining for many people for some time now. And we really just touched on that subject from a number of different angles and tried to you know figure out well, what's going on there, where might things be going, and what's actually driving driving this state of anime or state of decline that we discuss at various points throughout the discussion. So if you're interested in sociology and social psychology and what it is about human social psychology and how we interact with each other that gives rise to these larger patterns that we see in society, how certain institutions develop and how they behave, how certain policies get put into place, why we have laws, what function they actually play. If you're interested in those types of things, this is a really interesting discussion. Leighton's not a scientist as most of my guests actually are. He's a uh, he's a writer and a journalist, and he's a background in sociology. Nonetheless, uh, I really like the way that he writes about things, and I thought a lot of his ideas were really interesting, and they, they dovetail a lot with some of the things that I've been thinking about recently. As always, if you enjoy the content I'm producing on this podcast, please like, share, and subscribe. You can subscribe to the free weekly newsletter or become a paid supporter to support the podcast further at mindandmatter.substack.com. This episode is supported in part by The Amino Company. They specialize in making science-backed amino acid products that you can mix into any drink. Their products contain a mixture of essential amino acids, the building blocks of proteins in the body, as well as other nutrients including minerals like iron and electrolytes like potassium. Your body is constantly repairing damage and your muscles and tissues need the right mix of amino acids and nutrients to do this effectively. One thing I like about Amino Co. is they actually conduct clinical trials to determine what their products really do. They have a variety of formulations and engineered for different purposes, and my personal favorite is one called Heal, which has been shown to be three times more efficient at triggering muscle growth and repair than other protein sources. It helps maintain healthy inflammation levels and preserve muscle mass during periods of inactivity. I mix this product into the water bottle I bring to the gym and consume it before, during, and after my workouts, and I have felt a noticeable difference in my performance during those workouts and my recovery times from soreness and fatigue afterwards. Their products are keto-friendly, soy-free, vegetarian or vegan, gluten-free, and non-GMO, so they are compatible 
compatible with almost any diet or lifestyle. You can support the podcast and try Heal or any of their other products by using the discount code MIND when you visit aminoco.com slash mind. You will get 30% off your purchase. If you work out regularly or do intensive exercise, I recommend trying AminoCo's products. I get a lot of companies reaching out to me about advertising, and I only end up using and liking a small percentage of the products that I see. So check out aminoco.com slash mind and use the code MIND to try these products today for 30% off. And with that, here's my conversation with Leighton Woodhouse. stuff on Substack for some time now, and I really like your writing. Thank you. Yeah, I know you cover interesting topics. The writing's good. I mean, just irrespective of uh, what you write about, I just love the way that you actually write. Thank um, you very much. I also, I love how you too, um, you you talk about contemporary subjects, but you also sort of bring in and, and kind of revitalize a lot of old ideas that people yeah. probably haven't heard before. Um, and I always, I always appreciate that. Um, yeah. And so where, where, uh, you said you're calling in from Oakland. Yes. I live in Oakland. And mm-hmm. so how long have you been there? Well, I grew up in the Bay area. Um, so this is home in terms of, um, in terms of my childhood. Um, I grew up in Berkeley, um, and I've lived here in Oakland for probably the past five years. Um, before that I was in LA for quite some time, um, brief stint in New York city, um, Went to college on the East Coast. I think that about covers it. Okay, so so you grew up in the yeah. Bay Area. You've been on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. You've also been in LA. You know, when mm-hmm. it comes to the Bay Area and LA, and a lot of cities in in America, but but I think the West Coast cities in particular. I live in Seattle. I've spent a fair amount of time in Portland. Mm-hmm. I've been down to SF and LA several times over the last few years. What <laughs> what's going on? Um, you know, a, a lot of people are talking about these cities, you know, SF and LA, maybe, you know, sort of as the, the poster children of this phenomenon that's going on where we see just this explosion in homelessness and drug addiction and stuff. Yeah. As someone who's been there for a number of years, how how have you observed that change actually take place? And, and what do you think is going on there? Well, <clears throat> First of all, I think you see it as well, because it's definitely uh, in Seattle, um, this sort of civilizational breakdown. Um, You know, having grown up in the Bay Area and spent and I've lived in California almost my entire life, but I've spent enough time on the East Coast to be able to draw a contrast. And, you know, I've always felt like, of course, like New York City is now experiencing a little bit of a touch of, of what we have here. Um, you know, a lot of a lot more violence um, and just random crime and things like that. But my experience has been that the East Coast is somewhat of a more civilized place than the West Coast. Um, and I mean that um, I know that just sounds like a pejorative against the, 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 the West Coast, but I, I mean something specific by that, which is like, I think that and maybe you know New York City is what I'm most familiar with on the on the East Coast, but there's something about living in such a dense um, area where being in public is such a big part of your day to day life that I think it builds. And you know, we're going to get into Durkheim, but this is very Durkheimian about kind of it, it builds the sense of social solidarity um, that we never have had on the West Coast. A lot of it because of our car culture. Um, you know, single family home uh, living. Uh, but but then also there's something political on the West Coast. You know, there's this um, there's this libertarian strain to the culture on the West Coast. I mean, here in the Bay Area, it's kind of where it was created because a lot of this stuff, if you've read um, that book, uh, the famous book uh, from cyber culture, counter, from counterculture to cyber culture, he writes about about this, uh, about this sort of, um, you know, the back to the land movement in the 60s, which, well, actually, he goes back further than that with the with the um, with the, the, the military infrastructure in uh, California, combined with this sort of what happened in the 60s of the back to the land movement created this kind of like tech libertarian um, ethos, which then was fused with the West Coast's inherent kind of liberalness. Um, so now we have this. What was the name of that book? Uh, what was his name? Um, it, it's called From Counterculture to Cyberculture. Fred, 
uh, I'm forgetting his name now. He's a Stanford professor, and it's about Stuart Brand, who's the guy who created the whole Earth catalog and his role in kind of creating his role in creating the cultural conditions that gave rise to the the the, the computer revolution and then Silicon Valley. Um, so it's an interesting book. Um, anyway, so there's this sort of like the politics here are very left libertarian, which is a a dangerous combination, in my opinion, um, because it's sort of like there's both the kind of um, commitment to social justice, which is a good thing, but there's the the sort of um, uh, the there's a reflexive. How do I describe this? There's, there's like it's sort of like the the um, big nanny state kind of authoritarianism fused with this sort of like um, anything goes libertarianism, which creates a situation in which like, for example, you know, we have this idea that homeless people who are pitching tents on sidewalks, defecating in the street, um, you know, who are enslaved to their addictions. It's not their fault. I mean, they may have made some mistakes that got them into this position in the first place. But once you're just full on psychotic and addicted, you're no longer obviously in control of yourself. And there's and then this at this attitude prevails among progressives in the Bay Area, which is like, well, that's their right to live as they choose. And we shouldn't intervene. And um, any kind of application of a coercion is somehow immoral, even though the alternative is allowing people to live in utter mi misery while destroying the social fabric of our cities. Um, so, and I think that's very much the same in, in I think Seattle yeah. has, a, has a lot of that too. Yeah. There's, um, I mean, there's some interesting psychology there, I think, you know, as someone who's a big, uh, a big fan of choice among, you know, uh, psychologically sovereign adults, you know, in almost any domain of life, you know, what is the, what is the word choice mean in the context of someone who is literally psychotic and literally addicted to right. know, fentanyl or methamphetamine or what have you. Right. Right. There is no choice. I mean, it's, this is, I've, I've had this argument so many times that like addiction is not a choice. It is a lack of choice. And if you do not intervene, I mean, it's sort of like reminds me of the, you know, the cliche um, uh, thought experiment with a tracks with the, the you know the split track with the train coming down it and one person's on and tied up on the tracks on one side one one track and 10 people on the other but you actually have to hit the lever to be able to switch to the one that kills the one person it's like we are on we are not touching the lever and headed towards the 10 people that the train is about to barrel over and we're like well we're moral people this is the ethical choice it's like it's not the ethical choice you're you're allowing people to die by refusing to intervene um and i re there's you know i'm not going to pretend that there isn't a lot of moral complexity around the decision to intervene and essentially use coer coercive means to to help people that is a morally complicated situation as well, but let's not pretend that refusing to do that is not also morally fraught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and and the sort of the general issue of, I guess, social decay as you know, it manifests in in more homelessness, more drug addiction, more psychosis, more suffering among that population. It it's, it seems to be happening very steadily and linearly, in in my view. So I've I've been on the West Coast for six years now, and I moved to Seattle. And I live in a neighborhood which, uh, you know, when I moved here, it was described as having character that's up and coming <laughs> um, and that will be getting better. And that's not what happened. And what's kind of in my what view, neighborhood is it? Uh, I live in Pioneer Square, which okay. loosely oh, speaking, um, yeah, you might well. be able to say that that's the analog of um, uh, what's 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 the big one in SF where the Tenderloin, the Tenderloin. Yeah, it's yeah. not that bad. But what I was about to right. say is, you know, when I visited you know, I've been in Seattle. I visited Portland, LA, and SF multiple times over the past few years, multiple times each. And my personal experience is almost like Seattle, Portland today is like what Seattle's going to look like in one or two years. Seattle mm -hmm. or Portland is maybe one or two or three years behind SF. And it's almost like you can see everything being pulled towards, you know, what the tenderloin in SF has become. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's spreading. It's getting worse, not better. And what's remarkable about that is, you know, when you look at the stats and stuff, and I know that you've written about this, you know, SF, as one example, you know, they spend something like a billion or more dollars a year on homelessness. So what the hell is going on? Like if that amount of resources yeah. is being allocated, why isn't any improvement seem to be happening? 
Right. And, and, you know, I've, I've written about this as well, because I mean, there is a relationship and it's an inverse relationship. Um, the more we spend, uh, the worse the problem gets. And I think that that's something that we need to be paying attention to. And, and, you know, I have a theory as to why it's happening and which is about the fact that, um, these, you know, there's an industry that has, that has evolved around the homelessness problem in San Francisco um, and around the addiction crisis in San Francisco. And like any industry, you know, no matter how many good people you populate it with, um, no matter how well intentioned um, these organizations are, uh, the organizations start to take on their own institutional interests, which are um, kind of discreet from the populations that they purport to serve. And on the most basic level, you know, they have an organizational interest in making sure that their funding is renewed. Um, I want to be clear that like, I'm not, I don't want to be unrealistically cynical. It's not like the leaders of these organizations wake up in the morning and decide and try to plot how they can maximize their budget for the following year. It's just an ever present in imperative that they have their budgets renewed because they have employees, they have a pay payroll to meet, they have rent to pay. And so, and you know, if you ever worked in the nonprofit industry, you're aware of how much that dominates your day to day. If you're working like a bootstrap nonprofit, you're constantly worried about get about your about, you know, your next year's budget. Yeah, um, not, not in terms of I mean, as you said, it's not like, you know, you're cynically trying to get the biggest budget possible necessarily. It's that you have employees and they have families and you have to make right. a payroll. And you, I like that you use the word evolved. These these institutional structures evolve organically based on incentives. They're not engineered by someone, right. you know, trying to make them this way. Right, right, exactly. It's a it's it's a very natural phenomenon. It's as natural as you know, I don't know, yeast emerging from flour and water. Um, and uh, and so you have these organizations. They have incentives. Um, and I think that what ends up happening, and this would be an interesting thing to pay close attention to exactly how it happens, which I have not done. But like, there's a process. There's an ideological formation that happens um, when you have these these immediate concrete incentives. But then you also have you know, political and moral convictions. Um, and there's a tension between those two. For example, uh, you know, you might start off thinking, well, we want to house all the homeless and get rid of the homeless homelessness problem, which one would assume most people who go into these organizations have that that value or that mission. Yeah, yeah. But there's a tension between that mission and the longevity of your organization, since if you solve the homeless problem, you're, you're you you have no more business model in a is a crass way of putting it, and so I think eventually over time, you know, it's, it's, this is a very kind of I think subtle and gradual process. You and I think it's kind of comparable. The way that it, that it happens is like natural selection. It's like you know just out of the confluence of ideas, sort of these certain ideas which have an elective affinity with your material interests start to start to emerge and, and sort of um, uh, 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 be naturally selected away from the others. And eventually, you come up with an ideology which is very conveniently serves your organization's interests, which is in the case of San Francisco, people should be allowed to camp on the streets. Um, people should be allowed to do as many drugs as they want to. Sure, if you want to get clean, then you should have that option. But we, there should be no pressure to push you towards recovery. We should just hand out foil, hand out pipes, hand out needles, create zones for you to be able to use your drugs, and then and then and then we can and we can serve that. We can staff that, or like you can give you know, a chunk of the city budget goes to us to staff and provide those services. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a convenient um, sort mm -hmm. of, um, it's a convenient fusion between your, your ideology, your quote unquote yeah. radical ideology and your frankly neoliberal material goals. Yeah. I mean, it would seem to be that the, the evolutionary dynamic here is that you get this nice complementarity between the material interests of the institution wanting to perpetuate itself and sort of the ideology forming around that such that um such that those interests are served while at the same time the people the people um engaging in the behavior within the institution um believe they're doing the right thing and are sort of yes. blinded to the fact that they're not actually doing what they think they're doing which is decreasing exactly. the amount of suffering among these populations Exactly. And we should like be clear that like these organizations, so they, you know, these organizations, these nonprofits are, I've written about this before as well, you know, they are 
it's a neoliberal business model. And I mean that in the sense that like at one point in time, it was the government's responsibility to 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 take on these tasks. But now in city after city, we've gotten just over the like in you know, the last 30 or 40 years, we've gotten used to these ideas of like these public private partnerships and 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 um and sort of, uh, outsourcing um these um municipal responsibilities to non to private nonprofits, which have which have no transparency requirements, et cetera. And so, you know, we, we've, we've, um, it's been adopted in many very progressive cities where it's like, we're instead of having city um, workers do this stuff, we're gonna have um, this constellation of shoestring nonprofits do it. Um, and that is privatization. It's just that it's not seen as privatization in these progressive areas because you're talking about a nonprofit, it's 501c3, right. you know, and these are like do-gooders who sign up for it. And these are political radicals also who tend to staff it. They're like, you know, they're like anarchists and they have pink hair or whatever. So like, clearly this isn't privatization, but come on, it's privatization. And so like the business model is a neoliberal one, which is essentially like shifting responsibility from the public sector to the private sector to administer, to, to take care, to manage mm -hmm. these populations. But the political ideology is like, aesthetically radical yeah yeah i see and so does it simply not occur to people to sit down and say things like all right we've been doing things this way for x number of years let's just look at the data how many of the homeless people that are being served in this way are choosing to get off drugs and seek that kind of treatment and how many aren't because the answer would seem to be basically zero percent of them <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, is is, is, mean, no, is like no one noticing this, or is it being ignored? Or I think the ideology takes care of that. I mean, like you know, you have uh, like first of all, you know, I, I think when when the sort of the the, the leaders of this nonprofit industry take a walk through the tenderloin or or through pioneer square or do you guys have an area called the blade is that like some skid row in in um, seattle not not that i've heard of okay okay yeah. maybe that was some time ago um but uh but uh you know the the um you, i think they walk through these areas and they they say to themselves so oh, the the shame and 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 horrors of capitalism you know they're like this is this is this is the human wreckage of of uh, you know our white supremacist fascist state and our evil capitalist system you know i think that's as far as the ideology goes and then it's like well and then there's this kind of there's this white savior complex i mean i'm not not all these people are white and i'm not there's no point in bringing race into this but you know um as a shorthand there is sort of this like the equivalent of maybe it's a class-based savior complex but there's this sort of like oh i you know will be a steward to these people and um and take care of these casualties of capitalism and respect them and give them dignity and what respecting and giving them di dignity means is to allow them to continue to live in absolute misery because that's supposed to be their autonomous choice like you know a lot of these people who i've argued with i believe think that the choice to that living on the street in a sidewalk doing meth all day is a sovereign is, choice that's yeah made. is like is like a, a decision that people have made rather than a hole you've fallen in and cannot get out of right. and so like their dignity is, is somehow respecting their dignity to not change this, this situation for them um so i think the ideology is very malleable and and has no problem accommodating those concerns yeah and so what about like so so when we think about the drug addiction component of this in particular right, there are many different views that many different people have on here um you know the, the you know everyone's got a different view on sort of the spectrum of legal versus illegal versus decriminalized how, how we should be criminalizing certain types of drug use or not and what that should look like in any society you've got the SF model, we'll just call it the way that things are being handled in SF today. Mm -hmm. You've got some, let's compare and contrast that with a way that another society does it. I think an interesting one there is Portugal, right. where they've done a lot of decriminalization. And my understanding is that many people have a confused view on how that model is actually implemented and governed in Portugal. Yes. So can you talk about that a little bit and, and kind of contrast it to what we're doing here on the West Coast? Yeah, and I've never been to Portugal, but Michael Schellenberger has written quite a bit about about it. And Michael and I are, you know, kind of friends and collaborators. And um, my understanding from Michael and from other people I've spoken to who have been to Portugal is that um, none of the stuff that you see in San Francisco is happening in Lisbon. You know, you, people are not smoking 
meth on the street or pitching sidewalks on the street. And if you do, there's law enforcement. They enforce laws there. Um, and uh, but in for, or an arrest does not mean incarceration. This is something that people need to like understand about the criminal justice system is that arresting somebody is just stopping them from doing what they're doing and detaining them for a period of time. And then you have various uh, 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 pathways you can go down, only one of which is incarceration. Um, but, you know, they have the infrastructure to force people and the laws to force people into um, recovery. Um, and that's what I think that we should be doing here. So it's not they haven't done this like free for all abolish the police type attitude where they're just like we'll just let it happen and then we'll just you know make sure that people don't overdose and we'll administer them narcan if they do that's not what's happening in portugal yeah my understanding in portugal is they've decriminalized drugs so you you know you it's okay to have them but you can't sell them you can't use them openly in public and those things are policed like right. you will be you will be penalized you won't be you know you won't be sent to prison for life but you will be fined or something if you engage in those activities right right but they have a decriminalization framework so it's not that decriminalization in portugal does not mean you can just walk around smoking meth and shooting heroin wherever you want whenever you want however you want no, it, quite the opposite. It's a it's a more civilized society than what we have here in California. And you know, the people who most defend the right of people to smoke meth on a sidewalk, um, you know, they think of themselves as as compassionate because they're in their minds, they're they are sort of um, defending the dignity and autonomy of the 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 least among us. But like the Tenderloin is a working class neighborhood. It's a it, it has been um, for, you know, a hundred years has been a working class neighborhood. It used to be where the the maritime workers went and the, a lot of the SROs are are, are left over from um, the these like uh, cheap hotels that maritime workers would rent out um, when they were on leave on on shore. And then it became sort of a you know, it's always been this this very working class neighborhood, but like really the the a lower class neighborhood, like the most marginal of the working class. Um, and uh, and today it continues to be like there are a like it's not Skid Row in LA. There are Skid Row is mostly you know commercial warehouse based like area. You know there's like there are retail stores, but it's a lot of like there's the flower district and the fashion district where it's a lot of big wholesale places. So there's not a lot there's not a lot of population density in terms of like um, certainly in terms of residents. Like I don't think many people I don't know the number, but outside of ho homeless people, there aren't. It's not like there's big condos in 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 in, um, in Skid Row. The Tenderloin is a densely populated area with tons and tons of immigrant families a lot of yemeni families is the is the is the most recent uh, sort of influx so there's a lot of people who fled the war in yemen and uh, the only place that they could afford is the tenderloin um you know yemeni families tend to come from fairly culturally conservative um muslim families so you can imagine the culture shock mm, when they yeah. have to walk their kids on, on onto the streets and seeing what they're seeing they have these um they used to have they, they used to have a thing called the yellow brick road which i think they're bringing back which is um they had like a in the tenderloin they had from certain like residential i believe apartment buildings to schools they would have pathways that were marked in 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 yellow um and th that was the yellow brick road for kids to be able to get to school and during the, the hours of kids going to and from school, the police would ask the drug dealers and the drug users, users to vacate that area for like an hour. Um, and the drug dealers abided by it because it's, you know, it, why not? Like, it's not a big deal for them. And it's better than having to, to, to complicate things with the police. But it's like they set up these yellow brick roads so that kids would be wouldn't have to be exposed to like walking through an open air drug market. They don't have that anymore. But what they do have is a bunch of volunteer parents who come out and basically create like a human corridor to walk kids to school. So it's like, where's your compassion for for these poor immigrant families who have to live in this shit, you know, they can't go to the, 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 the playground because the playground is filled with like tents and users and there's drug users. I mean, drug dealers right across the street, openly dealing meth. It's like, you know, there's more kids in the tenderloin per capita than any other neighborhood in San Francisco. It's like, this is, those are the people who are suffering from it. Not me. I live in Oakland across the Bay. I don't have to see that outside my front door every day. And, and so, you know, when you when you think about the people who live in these neighborhoods, the people you were just talking about, other people, and they're living amongst 
amongst this and adjacent to it, and they see it day after day. Not only are they seeing the drug use and the homelessness, but they're seeing um, various crimes, including sometimes even violent crimes, not being dealt with and not being punished and and not being deterred. What does that kind of experience day after day for months or years start to do to what we might just call the, the general social fabric of the neighborhood, the sense of culture and community? And what is that? how does that start to tie into um, what Durkheim and others would say is the purpose of laws? Yeah. Well, so for first of all, I think that there was a story of I, I believe it was a Yemeni family. It was it was a Muslim family, immigrant family from um, from the Middle East. And there's a 10 year old girl who was assaulted in the middle of a intersection by a woman who was, you know, who was like psychotically. She was she had a drug into psychosis and she attacked. It was a hate crime because I think she said something about her hijab. Ten year old girl hit her in the head and um, and uh, and that girl, this is, this is the the Chronicle reported on it. That girl, she saw her assailant like a few months later, just on the street. So this girl's already been traumatized by this crazy woman who just hit her in the head, and then she's just walking out. So she's seeing her. She's, she, she was just freed again, you know, after assaulting a child. So like you know, so you can imagine just on a personal level what the what, what the fear and trauma would be for that child. Yeah. Um, this child who who if if I'm right that she was Yemeni, then she was just. You know, her family had escaped a war to get into this context. By the way, there's another related story, and I will come back to your, to your question, but there was another family, a Yemeni family in the East Bay in Oakland, who um, who fled the war um, They and set up a liquor store in Oakland. And there was a complicated, I won't go into the details, but somebody got shot in their liquor store. And then then, then the assailants, or the, the in retaliation, the, the, the people who retaliated thought that the owners of the store were mixed up with the person who shot them. So they burned down the house of the owner of the store and the, the, the one, the father, what uh, the, the father in the family and his two year old daughter were burned alive in the fire. They had wow. escaped. They'd escaped Yemen to come to America to escape violence. And this is what happened to them. Um, so anyway, to get back to your question, um, you know, uh, vis-a-vis Durkheim, I'm a big, I'm a, I believe that um, retribution is, serves an important purpose in criminal justice. It's not the only purpose, but a lot of people on the left outright dis- dismiss retribution as, as serving any purpose whatsoever, right? They're like, maybe you can make a case for incapacitation. Maybe you can make a case for deterrence. Definitely, we should be doing rehabilitation, but we're not doing that in the criminal justice so, so system. Before you go further, can you just sort of unpack those at a very basic level? You've got deterrence, you've got incapacitation, you've got retribution as possible reasons to legally punish someone. What right. are each of those things and what's sort of the common sense thinking that most people might have about each one right so we have rehabilitation which we clearly don't do and you know that's fix you so you don't um become so when you get out you can become an upstanding citizen instead of a, a career criminal um incapacitation is just basically like keep you off the streets right we, like we, if you're if you're a repeat offender and you're just going out every weekend dealing drugs or you know um murdering people um you should be held in a place behind lock and key where you have no access to the streets because then fewer people get hurt. Um, by the way, you know, this is that's mass incarceration and a lot of people have a knee jerk reflex against it, as do I. I don't believe that mass incarceration is a good thing, but we should acknowledge that um, that one factor in the dip in the crime rate, you know, that that happened between the the, the over the last like 20 years and still started spiking up again was a result of the war on drugs, which everybody for good reason, um, you know, uh, frowns upon. But we incapacitated a lot of criminals. And when they served their terms and were released back onto the streets, they they were repeat offenders and we saw the crime rate go go up again that's not the only factor but it is a factor is that one of the reasons why the crime rate plummeted is because we had so many people who would have otherwise been committing crimes in in prison so um again that doesn't justify the war on drugs or or mass incarceration it's just a reality that we have to 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 live with and and kind of accommodate um but anyway so that's that's incapacitation deterrence is you know, if if I if I if I do this, then I'm going to get in trouble. So I'm not going to do it, right? If 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 there's a deterrence doesn't work in America either because the clearance rate of these police departments is so low that 
chance, you know, you're going to get away with a crime. Like the chances are in order for deterrence to work, you have to be reasonably co confident that you're going to get caught. Um, and, uh, and so, but that's deterrence. And then retribution is revenge. It's social revenge, right? It's like you, it's a pound of flesh. It's like you commit a, eye for an eye, you commit a crime and you should be punished for it. Um, and that seems, you know, mean, um, evil even, um, to a lot of people, but this is what Durkheim wrote about. In order to have norms, you have to have punishment, um, because uh, because if an if you have a social norm, we all agree to this code. We're we're not going to murder anybody, right? That's wrong to do, and we're all going to agree not to murder anybody. Well, when somebody goes out and murder murder somebody, they have committed a crime not just against the victim. This is why we have a civil court system and a criminal court system. When you do a civil offense, you're just doing an offense against a private party. But when it's a criminal offense, you are um, you are committing a crime against your immediate victim, but also you have transgressed against the entire society. Mm. You know, we have the state of California versus X or the, the yeah, United yeah. States of America versus X instead of private party versus private party. I see. Yeah, so this is, I guess this is why, uh, you know, if you and I enter into a contract with each other, a business agreement or something, it'd be, sort of be me versus you, if one of us, um, if I claim that you violated the terms or something, but if I come to your house and maim you, it's not you versus me. You can't even, right? You can't even, for, you could forgive me, let's say, mm -hmm. if I come and maim you. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be prosecuted. You know, the, the exactly. legal ball would still roll down because I have, um, you know, from a legal societal perspective, I've sort of, uh, I've I have uh, made a transgression against the wider society in addition to you as an individual. Exactly, I'm not the only one you need to make amends to. So if I forgave you for maiming me, I could go to the prosecutor and express my my forgiveness and plead for them not to prosecute you or to give you a lighter charge. Um, and the prosecutor would probably take that into consideration. But it's their it's 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 it's, it's their prerogative, not mine, to decide what to do with you. And you know, th there's a social function to to that process, which is that. Uh, people, in order for the norm to be upheld, people need to know that if you break from that norm, then you, um, then the society has essentially repaired the strength of the norm by having it by having its retribution bear out. This is sort of like, like it's the same. Irving Goffman wrote about the the apology, the act of apologizing to somebody, um, and how weird it is when you think about it. Because if I like punch you in the face. And then I go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I'd say something to the extent of like, I don't know what came over me. That wasn't me. That was this other person, you know, who what, but of course it was me and we all know it was me who did mm -hmm. it. But I, what I'm saying is in that moment that I transgressed against you, um, I was acting as somebody who doesn't have respect for this norm, yeah. not to punch you in the face. And but I'm, in fact, I'm realizing that. Right. Now. Yeah. The, I, I, you're paying tribute to the norm by saying, I'm sorry, I am somebody who acknowledges that norm. Will you please f allow me back into the moral community by accepting my apology? And so, and by doing that, you, you pay, it's like, uh, what's the phrase for hypocrisy is the tribute that some people pay to, um, uh, forget the, the the phrase, but anyway, it's like you apologize and you are essentially paying tribute to the norm by acknowledging that you transgressed against it, and by doing so, you acknowledge the vol the continued validity to the norm, which you have uh, whose validity you have undermined by carrying out the transgression. That's what retribution serves in the criminal justice system. It upholds the norm. We, you know. We all understand this because we're all, you know, even including um, like lefties who uh, would like to take retribution out of the criminal justice system. We're all pissed off that no bankers went to to, to jail after yeah. causing the financial crisis. Right. You know, it's like it's not enough that that Merrill Lynch, like you know, um, yeah. And it's some, not it's not merely that some individual didn't go. It's that no broader signal was sent out to the wider community right. that if you engage in this you behavior, you will be punished. Exactly. And it's like, and it's like, so, so it's like we, we, even though, okay, we, we save the economy from complete, um, you know, Great Depression collapse. You could even say that there was some kind of restorative justice done with the banks with the passage of Dodd Frank or whatever. Um, uh, and, uh, or whatever the legislation was that, that put in the new rules. Um, you, we've done the, the reparative work. One could make of a case that we've done the reparative work to, um, to, to solve the problem. But the fact that no bankers went to jail indicates that we've done no work around the moral uh, transgressions of Wall Street at that time. 
the lefties I argue with, I, I think would have no problem understanding that injustice. And yet there's this like, this like refusal to acknowledge that if you deal drugs on the street, if you're dealing fentanyl on the street for a year, and it's not enough that you just be, I mean, the most important thing is that you be, is that that activity is stopped so that people's lives are saved. But also on top of that, you should be serving a punishment for that crime so that we uphold the norm that that's not okay to do. Yeah. I mean, this, this sort of gets to, you know, one of the things I thought was interesting that the Durkheim wrote about was, you know, why things become crimes. And I think what he was saying is that, um, you know, the things that are crimes, it's, it's not like we have a bunch of experts who sit down and sort of formulate all of these things scientifically or something. We're, we're actually, we actually make things illegal because, because they, violate the things that are just already the intuitions of most people in a community. So so literally what he said was, we do not condemn acts because they are crimes. They are crimes because we condemn them. Right. But then when you see people not condemning things that intuitively most people think are condemnable, that has this sort of uh, acidic dissolving effect on you know the sense of community that that everyone feels wherever they live. Yeah, this is one thing I love about Durkheim is that, you know, when I started reading Durkheim, I, like uh, many other people who come from a political tradition of the left, you know, saw things and still do. I'm still very quite obsessed with um, with class analysis, um, but it was a, a kind of a welcome um, respite to see it from another point of view, because Durkheim is very much not a, you know, he doesn't look at the world through a class lens. And that's very helpful in, in achieving certain insights, which you would not get from a class analysis where you'd be like, well, the rules must be written that way, because the ruling class favors it. When in fact, you're like, no, you look at the the the, or the genealogy of these rules, and that's not how they emerged at all. They emerged organically as a way to achieve social solidarity to keep to, to keep social, you know, to keep communities coherent. Um, and what we're seeing with this lawlessness in the Bay Area and the entire West Coast, really, I fear the consequences of it, because not only because of the material cost of, of crime, but also because of the undermining of any sense of like, I'll give you a specific example, retailers now in in mid the mid market area in San Francisco, right across the street from the Tenderloin, you know, are now putting in place new rules because people are just shamelessly shoplifting and uh, and you can't stop them, right? People are coming all day, every day and just boosting product. And so, you know, they, these practical measures are being put in place like, okay, now for these products, you have to go to the register and, and ask for them. You can't just pull them off the shelves. And also, if you want to use the bathroom, you have to have an app that opens up the bathroom because we have too many people coming in here and doing doing needles and dropping the needles down the toilet clogging up the plumbing system. So it's like the, there's this sort of like these measures start to like in five years, we're going to be live in a world where like I feel like to go to Target, you'll need to have an app that like has facial recognition or something, you know, that like allows you into the store. And it's like, of course, that's going to happen because they need to put it because if there's no law and order, then they need to create private access rules. And is that the society we want to live in this bunker society, where we're all just separated from each other, that, that should be a dystopia for people on the left. But that's the natural uh, sort of um, conclusion for, uh, for just not enforcing laws. One of the things that I want to circle back to is, you know, when we were talking about this sort of nonprofit industrial complex and how it evolves organically. And you get this sort of um, complementarity between the the specific policies and actions that people in those institutions are advocating for, which serve the the interests of the institution to perpetuate itself. There's this complementarity between that and the ideologies that evolve to to for people to rationalize what they're doing and why. And you know, it seems like people often adhere to these ideologies with what I think can only be described as like a religious fervor. And you know, Durkheim and others wrote wrote also a lot about you know the purpose and function of religion in society. It's a topic mm. I'm very interested in. So, uh, do you have any thoughts on like what the relationship between the decline of what we can just call traditional organized religions in America has been um, in relationship to the emergence and ascension of some of these new political and social ideologies or these new sort of institutional structures that, you know, are ostensibly trying to remedy problems that they are in fact perpetuating. Yeah. 
So Durkheim wrote like, uh, pardon this like mini lecture, um, but uh, but for for you know I assume most of the listeners have not read Durkheim, um, but in in the elementary forms of a religious life, Durkheim looked at um, the field notes of a bunch of anthropologists who were looking primarily at uh, Aboriginal tribes in Australia, and um, the, he sort of in these these were. These were quote unquote primitive societies. I'm just going to use that term, even though some people find it offensive. Um, but by primitive, and he used that term, but really, I think he even used the term savage. But really, what he meant was elementary, um, uh, pre division of labor, um, and uh, and so these were these were um, society communities in which people lived isolated lives. Like if you're a subsistence farmer. Uh, you you live in a community where you have neighbors who you don't see every day because they live too far away, and but you also don't see them every day because you don't need to see them every day because you're a subsistence farmer. Everything that you have is at home, right? With you, with your family, you do not. You literally have no material need to see other people ever. So his question was, how do you cohere a community together of people who live materially isolated lives, or how do they cohere their communities together? So he looked at these tribes where that was essentially the material conditions of their existence. And he found that periodically they would come together and have these religious ceremonies um, in which that would involve, that were really intense. They involved like a lot of dancing and drumming and um, spiritual elevation, chanting and like going without Sh water Shamanism food. basically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Going out with water and food, without water and food for days on end um, in, in, you know, intense heat. And, um, and so, uh, and and what, and they would achieve this sort of transcendental um, uh, experience with these rituals. And what his Durkheim's theory was was that so he called this collective effervescence. It's like the the, the feeling when you train, you're in the midst of like you know we've experienced it at a, at, you know, on a sort of lower level like a basketball game, you know, and like or like a political march where you're like chanting and you just feel like you're one of the crowd and you're kind of uplifted, and it creates the sense of cohesion of the of of everybody there. So basically, you transcend your life as an individual and you enter into the sublime state when you are. When you belong to the life of the collective yeah and you know immediately i think of um a couple things here like you know when you see um there are many kinds of examples of this but you know like when when some sports team wins the championship mm -hmm. and then everyone's out riding in the streets you're like why yeah. the hell are they riding effectively but it's because they go into this psychological state where they don't feel like an atomized individual they feel like part of a coherent community and it is a very good feeling people yeah. like having that feeling and you know, I didn't, didn't actually expect the conversation to go here, but the last episode with a man named um, Michael Winkleman, an anthropologist, was all about shamanism um, mm -hmm. in ancient hunter-gatherer groups, and you know what it was and what it did. And the thing that I did not realize is how frequently these sort of shamanic group ritual practices involving you know drumming and and reaching these ecstatic states actually were it wasn't once per year it wasn't mm -hmm. once per lunar cycle it was every you know two to four weeks in most traditional yeah. cultures because mm -hmm. presumably that that frequency is required to maintain the right. kind of group coherence necessary to just have a stable society. Durkheim actually writes about that. He says explicitly that, you know, when these people go back to their own private existences as individuals, the collective effervescence that they experience has sort of like a, you know, there, there's there's a residue of it that remains, but then it starts to deplete. And so like after, when, when it gets to the point where it's pretty much depleted, then there's a need for another cycle to bring the tribe together again. And in Durkheim's view, you know, this is all in, in these, these pre-division of labor societies he called this mechanical solidarity because it was like a mechanical thing where you just like come together have it and then part and then come together and apart and it's very or, or mechanical as opposed to organic um organic solidarity is the pre is the the solidarity that comes from a post like a, from a more complex society when i wake up in the morning and have a cup of coffee right it's like i'm waking up in a house that was built by somebody else in a bed that was built by somebody else with sheets that were manufactured by somebody else i go and get take out coffee beans that were grown by somebody else and distributed by somebody else. It's like a million people have have participated in the process of getting me from the bed to my hot cup of coffee every morning, right? Because we're all integrated in that way. We are the farthest thing from self-sufficient. And so Durkheim believed, and I think was um, a too confident in this opinion that um that that organic solidarity them those material bonds of of uh, 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 between us um start to um 
uh, sort of crowd out the need for this mechanical solidarity. And so that's why you have religion start to play more and more of a background role in modern societies. But the thing that we found is that you still need that that you, it's not enough. You still need the mechanical solidarity. Yeah, you, that's that why collective effervescence must mm -hmm. be felt. Otherwise, things are just going to disintegrate into chaos. Right, and so we something have, will evolve. Right, and so we had you know we had uh, uh, for a long time you know the United States bucked the trend of Western Europe and continued to be a very religious society. Even though you know it, even in the United States it it, it was uh, it tailed off over generations. Um, but you know we as the most advanced capitalist society we still had a lot of religion and now religion has we have been falling into the pattern of Western Europe with people being less and less attentive to church and so now we found you know, other ways, and I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg in this case, but we found other ways to achieve that, the, that this, this sort of in-group feeling. And a lot of that is, you know, just like collective effervescence can be a very beautiful thing and it can also be a very dangerous thing. Um, and in the same way, the sort of in-group, out-group stuff that we're now finding, I think, online um, is, is, it's like there's this digital version of collective effervescence, which is like, you know, the the, the group pylons on on Twitter, the, mm. the sort of the, the mob actions that create the sense of like, clearly the purpose is to, you know, we don't quite achieve a transcendental state, but there is this feeling of belonging, this like kind of very, the very like lizard brain feeling of belonging that comes yeah. from interactions. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think we all know intuitively that everyone wants to belong. When you start to think about it more deeply, right, we start to think about things like, you know, we're, we're social primates, we exist in social status hierarchies. People want to maintain their status or increase it. No one ever wants to decrease it. Mm -hmm. And that ties into some of the things that, that we're talking about, I think. And if I try and stitch a couple of things together here, when we were talking about the sort of nonprofit industrial complex mm -hmm. and the sense of belonging it presumably gives the people that go into that line of work and subscribe to some of those ideologies, you know, where do, where do those people come from in the sense of I think this probably ties into the fact that right college became so important for people to go to and more and more mm -hmm. people had to go to college and we produced so many of those people. And I think a lot of people would even say that we overproduced to them, meaning more people started getting college degrees. They thought were a ticket to you know, some higher level of social status, whatever exactly that meant for any individual. Um, but there just weren't enough slots for a lot of people in in other domains of life. And so that sort of overproduction of people that feel like they have this ticket to a higher level social status creates a kind of anxiety that then funnels them elsewhere. Where does your mind go when we start thinking about things like that? Yeah, the overproduction of elites is a has always been a very dangerous thing. You know, so there there are I'm not an expert on this, but you know, I, I I have read accounts of the Crusades having been caused by the overproduction of elites because as populations got denser in Europe, they had these primogeniture laws where you had to, you know, hand all your your land down to the first son, and what that means is that the land plots started getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then the second son and the third son were left with nothing, um, and so you had all these elite aristocrat. Um, warrior aristocrat nobles with nothing to do and uh, and it became a crisis in Europe and then they were like okay we've got to do something with these people send them to Jerusalem you know to reclaim the Holy Land and then they went out and created this abomination of the Crusades so it's like this has always been a dangerous force in every society um, and I think we and I do believe that we have that now because we are producing um, more and more would-be white-collar workers but the, co the economy has become more and more bifurcated. Um, you know, there are only so many tech jobs to go around. And so we have, a, you know, the, I think the experience of the millennial generation was one in which uh, you had a bunch of kids who played by all the rules, you know, went to good colleges. And I'm, ta I'm not talking about the majority of millennials, the majority of millennials, like every other generation, um, don't have college degrees. But among the, 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 the elite tier of the millennials, you had all these these kids going to college and they, you know, naturally expected to, to, to have a upper middle class lifestyle um, after graduating from prestigious university. And, you know, then they graduated in the time of the Great Recession and uh, there were no jobs for them. You know, the, the sort of the, the girls, the HBO girls uh, kind of uh, story. Um, and so, so first of all, um, I, I wrote I wrote about this once before because Pierre Bourdieu wrote about this a very similar 
moment when this happened in Paris in the 19th century that created the Bohemians. Um, mm. I won't go into that too much, but there's a parallel thing that happened now where there is this sort of like, because colleges have become so hyper politicized, um, these kids graduated from a school with this sort of training, with this sort of um, this, um, th this, they had inculcated all these values of the political activist. And then they came out into a world in which um, they're, material expectations were not met. Um, and so they started going into the industries that they could and competing with each other um, over these jobs in like tech and in um, media. Um, but they brought with them this sort of the, the habitus of the, of the the professional of the like the political activist. And so there became this contest within these industries um, that uh, over like who's more politically pure. And you had this, you know, you had like the New York Times, the pivot that the New York Times had towards wokeness was driven. There was a really interesting New York Magazine article about how it was driven by the tech workers, like the people who are designing the New York Times app, not the reporters. And it's because they'd all come from the, the New York Times had in its in its um, in its uh, sort of mission to surpass all the which it achieved of surpassing all the other media outlets in terms of its digital presence, recruited all these people from Facebook and Twitter and all these Silicon Valley firms recruited all these coders, but they couldn't compete um, salary wise with those companies. So they basically said, look, well, you're wasting your life. Like, you know that you're not doing any good for the world by working for Facebook. If you come with us, like we'll pay you a decent salary, but you'll get the psychic ben benefit of being able to make a difference in the world. And they bought that hook, line and sinker. And then they came to the New York Times and they realized that journalism isn't like that, that they were like, you could you actually had to report stories as they happened and not the way the way you wish they'd happen that people with opinions that you don't agree with get space on the op ed age on the op page page two and they threw a, a fit and a temper tantrum and that this was kind of the, the 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 what generated the anger around that tom cotton op ed that ousted james bennett as the opinion editor a lot of that came from like the tech the tech folks at the, at the new york times so it's a clearly something that's beyond just the media it's a it's a it's a generational transformation that's occurred yeah and um you know one thing i want to unpack a little bit more is this concept of elites and what makes someone elite and there's a lot of confusion there um naturally because you know th this is a relative term um it's it's also a term that people use in different ways you know when, when some people sit, refer to the elites they're talking about one group of people when someone else refers to the elites they're talking about other people I'm just wondering what your take is on what makes someone an elite. And I think maybe a good hook there is this distinction that I think you made in, in at least one of your articles between um, like financial, cultural, and moral capital. Right. And there's these different forms of like social capital we can have. Traditionally, we think of capital as being the financial version. And that's maybe the most intuitive to think about, but it's not the only version of social capital that someone can wield. And so can you contrast those things and maybe use that as a way to think about what, what actually makes someone elite or powerful in a society? Yeah, so this is all uh, Pierre Bourdieu, um, uh, not my original thinking. So I'm just kind of regurgitating his, his uh, theory. But, you know, he looked at it as there's... Um, there's economic capital, which was sort of the, like the, the if you come from a Marxist tradition, you tend to to see that as the the, the sole distinguishing feature between between uh, classes mm -hmm. is your control of economic capital. Um, you know, Bourdieu saw perceived because he came from an anthropological background and he came into sociology with an anthropological background. He kind of perceived that these market economies are work in other things too. Um, he started, and I don't want to go too far in, on a tangent, but he, he, he gained this insight because he was, um, he went and did some research in Algeria, in French Algeria. And in Algeria at the time, you know, the French were trying to impose upon Algerians their market based way of thinking about the world and it wasn't taking. And so all these academics were like, oh, these Algerians are acting in an economically irrational way. Their culture is, their culture is just backwards because they, they can't accept Western economic rationality. And then he took a closer look and he was like, no, all of this stuff is very rational. It's like there's this gift giving kind of um, uh, practice, which Marcel Moss and other people have also looked into where it's like, you know, but we, we understand this too. If you give somebody a gift, and then they go, thank you. And then you give a, give a gift right back to you. 
it's offensive, right? Because then it makes it look like an economic transaction. Mm. You have to wait a period of time. But then if you don't give anything back, then you Ever. also feel slighted, right? Right, right. So there's this imperative that you need to wait a period of time to return the gift so that it doesn't look like a transaction, but you are, but it is in fact a transaction. And so it's sort of like, if you didn't understand that dynamic, then you'd look at somebody, they were like, somebody you'd look at these exchanges and you would consider them economically irrational because a direct exchange wasn't made. But in fact, a direct exchange couldn't have been made because it would violate this cultural norm. You needed to have this person would need to wait a period of time before returning the favor. So it's sort of like there's all these other things at work that are not just like what we understand is like a money transaction. Yeah. No, I mean, that that's interesting. I actually just got back from Burning Man myself, which mm -hmm. is by design a, a gift giving culture. And just to riff on what you just said, yeah, you're meant to gift things to people with no expectation of anything in return. And so you shouldn't give someone a gift right after they give you one. Um, but you also should be, you, you're looked at as you should be the kind, if you're here, you should be the kind of person that is going to be giving gifts to people unconditionally. So right. if you're not, if you're receiving gifts and you're never giving them out to other people, that that transgress transgresses that norm. And there's this sort of deep belief in, in people who participate in that in that uh, event, for lack of a better term, that you ought to be the kind of person that gives gifts in that kind of way. I feel like there should be like a sociological study or an anthropological study where you just send a bunch of uh, people undercover into Burning Man who just violate the norm, you know, who just like take and don't give back and just see what happens with the social structure of Burning think, Man. Yeah, that's that's an interesting hypothetical. Uh, <laughs> I'm definitely not going to advocate anyone actually do yeah. that. Yeah, it'll ruin the vibe. <laughs> um, so anyway, so so Bourdieu looked at at the you know these other forms of capital, uh, most famously cultural capital, um, and uh, cultural capital is essentially the 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 accumulated knowledge that one gains that allows them to function sort of fluent fluidly and fluently within a given social circle so you know if you have you know if you're going to be in upper middle class a college educated america then it helps to have some sort of basic understanding of I don't know, fine arts, you know, or like, I should say, if you do have uh, like a, 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 an extensive knowledge of, I don't know, the like, like, I'm trying to think of something that's more relevant than than it would have been like 20 years ago, but like, I don't know, like, uh, in indie rock, or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's going to get you somewhere right in 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 a in a social circle of people who all graduated from four year universities and are living in a city. Whereas if you go into a blue collar background, it's going to get you absolutely nowhere. Right. That's not the social that's not the cultural capital that works within that that this other social circle. They have their own forms of social of cultural capital, which also don't translate into your elite circles. But um, Borgia saw the university as essentially a transmission vehicle of cultural capital to um children of privilege basically i mean there's various tiers of universities so there were working class universities where you have different types of social um, cultural capital transmitted but at the elite tier you have people who are trained yes you get maybe you get some like ba actual job skills that help you on the job market but most of what you're learning in, in a four-year university you're never going to use on the job you're going to use it to um, in your in your social context, yeah. right? And, and perhaps this ties into why, um, you know, from from that perspective, from like this sort of cultural, informational perspective, um, the prestigious universities in America, which I went through, um, they're very homogenous yeah. in that way. So, like, like for example, like if you go to Harvard, I spent five years at Harvard. Someone else could spend five years at Stanford. They're not going to be like completely distinct cultural experiences. No, <laughs> they're actually going to be almost identical, even though, like in theory, right? These are completely independent organizations, um, and yet, like no matter what top tier university you go to, you get the same kind of uh, general cultural vibes in each one. Right, basically. right, right. You get a basic sort of you 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 are. They're finishing schools, right? You're you're taught a certain etiquette. Like finishing schools are easy to make fun of because you're like literally learning like which utensil to use, and that's like just so transparently about class, you know, signaling. But um, a university education is essentially inculcates in you not only. Uh, um, knowledge like the actual body of knowledge that you absorb is 
probably the least important thing. It's much more a set of mannerisms, speech, yeah. the way that you carry yourself, um, the, 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 like, an ironic sense of humor like yeah. all these kind of like keys yeah it reminds me of um right so there's this contrast between i think what you're saying is like right there's the things i learned when i was at university like what i literally the declarative knowledge i literally learned in chemistry class right that's you know arguably secondary to you know the we'll just call the cultural beliefs that you pick up and and this reminds me of rob henderson's phrase i, I talked to him some months ago on the podcast and he came up with this term called luxury beliefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it ties into what that we're term. talking about. It's like you learn how to, uh, it's right by direct analogy with the idea of a luxury good, right? A Louis yeah. Vuitton bag is a physical signal of your social status, your economic means. The idea of a luxury belief is you learn how to carry yourself and, you know, say things a certain way or believe certain ideas as a way to signal, yeah, I'm part of this strata of, of the culture. Right. What he calls luxury beliefs is what I call moral capital, which is just a sub variant of cultural capital, because in the past, you know, when Bourdieu wrote, he's been dead 20 years, um, he wrote primarily in the last century, but you know, in, in France, um, but when when what he would write about the sort of the cultural capital of um, you know, uh, uh, familiarity with classical music and with the canonical poetry and stuff like that. That, that doesn't get you far in America if you're in a, you know, if you're like start talking about Pr Proust or something, people are just going to think you're an ins insufferable snob. They're not, it's not going to get you any status. Maybe in some places it would get, still get you status, but it, you're much better off with a sort of um, a set of political and moral beliefs that have that. So th there's been this kind of transition where we've stopped using this knowledge of high culture and we've started to use uh, as a class signifier um a sensitivity and a subscription to certain political beliefs and values and like this very refined sensitivity around how you use the language you know like it's not a coincidence that you now have to there's actually a learning curve like it's not enough just like you grew up working class and then you have liberal politics because that's where your material interests are aligned um in fact, you know, a lot of those people are shunned by sort of the, the, the most elite tiers as being, you know, brutes, right? Because it, maybe they may have even considered voting for Trump because Trump was, uh, you know, railing against the elites. And so they're like monstrous, where, whereas, you know, if you're, if you're, if you, but if you have a command of the sort of the, the, the lexicon around, you know, centering black bodies and like these kind of obscure, really bizarre ways of speaking. Um, it, it that indicates your 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 class belonging and your upper middle class pedigree. And so there's been this sort of shift from the from the cultural capital that Bourdieu wrote about to now in an American context and increasingly in just a Western context to it's the exact same thing, but it's just the sub variant of what I call moral capital and what Rob calls luxury beliefs um, as these class signifiers. And so how does this start to tie into, you know, we were talking about religion earlier. When, what, how do elites sort of wield religious or ide ideological concepts in order to secure and protect their status as elites? And, and that could mean, right, that could mean elite in any sense of the word. It could mean someone with a lot of economic capital. It could mean someone with a lot of cultural capital. But how, how do we start to think about how some of these like ideologies evolve such that the concepts they're deploying are serving to sort of secure and protect people that have acquired a certain amount of status in society? Well, it's just like, uh, I just wrote a piece that I published the other day about um, the historical origins of cultural capital, looking at um, Norbert Elias's book, um, Civilizing Process. I might be mispronouncing his name because I've always called him Norbert Elias, but then I've watched some YouTube videos where people were talking, calling him Elias. So I don't know which one is right. But anyway, um, I'll stick with Elias. Um, Norbert Elias's book is about the transition from feudalism to uh, this sort of the period of transition from feudalism, capitalism, and the development of manners. And there's a point in time in the, the royal courts where um, the the aristocrats were in competition with the rising bourgeoisie, and they had already come to a point of fetishizing manners as a way of signifying your class distinction. And as the bourgeoisie learned those manners, like it's not too hard to figure out which utensils to use and you know what intonation to give certain languages. Like they could they could they could adopt those skills too. And as they did, the aristocrats had to 
further and further refine their manners and to a point of absurdity um, where it became like a Japanese tea ceremony, you know, but but that was born out of the competition of having to like every time the bourgeoisie would learn um, would 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 learn the the the, the appropriate um, mannerisms and the appropriate etiquette, then the, the aristocrats would would refine it even more so that they could call the bourgeoisie um, so they could continue to call the bourgeoisies like vulgar pretenders. And I think a similar thing happens with these political beliefs. It's like now it's not enough that you're just like not overtly racist or not racist at all, you know, and you subscribe to affirmative action and you have like, you know, all these other kind of conventionally liberal beliefs you have. Well, you're still a racist because you're not deploying this particular language because you don't have this even more radical belief of reparations and whatever. And like, you know, and then once reparations becomes uh, uh, commonly accepted, then it's like, well, that's, you know, there will be another tier because it is no longer useful as a, as a status conferring class distinct distinction mechanism. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really does get sort of down to basic human chimp stuff like everyone everyone wants to be cool right right the way you're cool by definition you're not everyone can be equally cool so right like you have to be cooler than other people it's almost like you know if i try and think back to like high school or something like you start to listen to some like obscure indie band or whatever because it's cool and it distinguishes you from the people who haven't heard, even heard of that band yet but then like everyone starts listening to them and well that's not cool anymore now you have to find like the new band that no one else has heard of it, it's basically yeah. the same thing happening yeah, well, I'm Gen X, so I know that very well. That like, maybe that's why I'm 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 so uh, uh, drawn to the notion of cultural capital because, of course, in in my generation, it was like you know when we were kids, we were famous for that, right? Like you found this cool, edgy thing, and you're like, Ugh, and then like they you really we, people were forever talking about selling out. They looked sold out. You sold out. They sold out. Da, 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 because it was like once Green Day, right? They were like everybody loved Green Day, and they were like playing at the Gilman, and they were punk rock, and then all of a sudden they you know we got a big record deal. I mean, they literally like totally sold out in a huge way. They admit it, but uh, but it's like once they got popular, then it's like the worst thing in the world was to listen to Green Day. So it's like it was, yeah, it's that that you know it was all about status competition. It was like, well, I'm refined, I'm so edgy that that um, that you know that I'm I'm on top of the like the newest thing. And once everybody starts listening to it, it's not cool anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm so confused, and why people my age are so confused by like these like influencers now where where it's completely the opposite it's like they're like so eager to 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 be sponsored by brands and to be listened to millions of people and we're like wait but that's not cool i don't get it, it doesn't compute you know yeah yeah well one of the things i'm interested in here is you know we've been talking about this notion of cultural capital and social status and you know sort of some of the the psychological and sociological concepts surrounding how how some of these ideologies evolve and you know why people want to wield and use certain ideas to to achieve a certain level of social status with all of that in mind you know my background is in like hardcore basic research science mm -hmm. um so i sort of come from that tradition and you know what's what's sort of really interesting and what a lot of people go through as they go into graduate school and do their phd and then their postdoc and then like they get higher and higher up the, the scientific ladder is you know there's this sort of um this tend to, there, there's this sort of distinction to be made between like the I, you know, the idealized version of the process of science and, mm. you know, science is sort of the special thing that, that, you know, is unpolluted by all the other like political and social things like, that most right. people go into science to avoid. Right. And then you sort of come up against the harsh reality of the mechanics of science. Like, like, how do I actually socially and administratively do the things that allow me to get grants and, you know, be within the structure that will allow me to do the literal science that I right. actually want to do. Um, and so, you know, given all the things that we were just talking about, how people wield certain, you know, ideas and how certain ideologies evolve to, um, for people to justify, like, how they're going to ascend or protect their social status, how do, how do secular enterprises, including things like science, start to get co-opted by elite factions to serve po political and social ends. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we saw that so vividly during COVID, right? With the scientist virtue signaling, just like everybody, every other idiot on Twitter. But like, I, I feel like this very, what, what you're describing as the scientific enterprise very much harkens back to uh, what we were talking about, the, about the nonprofit industrial complex where, you know, like Martin Gurry writes about this exact thing in, in uh, the revolt of the public, which is like, we have this concept, we continue to have this conception of scientists 
in the way that we conceived of them in like the turn of the century of the, the turn of the 20th century um the heroic sort of um uh um, renegade scientist who works alone, you know, Albert Einstein, right, in their lab, pursuing the truth and, um, and you know, and like uh, uh, discarding all the conventions. Um, and that's not how science works anymore, as you know better than I. Um, you know, now it is a big bureaucratic process in which, uh, you know, if you're a successful scientist, first of all, you're always working on a team. Second of all, like if you're most success, if the most successful scientists are running their own labs, right? They get to a point within as as bureaucrats where they have steady funding. They have a bunch. Of, they have a payroll that they're meeting. They're small business people, basically. They're like they're running their lab. They have their research assistants who are paid, um, and in order to do that, you need to keep getting your NIH grants, right? Like every year, you have to like that is foremost in your mind is renewing those those is. is continuing the, that, that grant cycle. Um, and so you fall into a pattern of doing the same experiments over and over and over again every fucking year, right? Like like you're just tweaking this thing and you're tweaking that thing. You know that they're going to approve it and give you funding the next time if you're just like, well, we've done these 12 variations, but there's these, this, uh, these other four variables that we now have to tweak. So we're going to do that next year. So give us more money. So it's like you can be a very like genuine scientists with a lot of intellectual integrity and moral integrity and still fall into the pattern of just being on the hamster wheel um, very much in the way that you can go into helping the homeless and be and have all your moral integrity but you fall into the hamster wheel of just being like needing to continue that funding and keep the machine going um, and uh, and so then you adopt the most convenient ideology that justifies that i'm not sure what the equivalent of that ideology would be among um, hard scientists you might you might know that well i'm sort of interested in this phenomenon of you know follow the science right. you know the, the that that phrase and variations of it that that are being repeated so often now because on the one hand of course someone like me as uh, someone with a scientific background totally believes in following science right um, but on the other hand we we both know that follow the science as a social phenomenon, that, that's not really what it is. It, it right. more or less basically means blindly follow someone with a certain type of credential just because they have it. Right. Or um, you must believe this thing and it must be true because one peer-reviewed paper in Nature Magazine says it could be true. Right. And, you know, Ironically, it's a very unscientific way to think, where you're right. sort of just meant it's to have a religious way to think. It's a religious way to think. You're meant to have faith in right. uh, have faith or, in the science. <laughs> yeah, a faith in the science. Ironically, uh, in, in what you know you can describe as you know the the modern day clergy. So mm -hmm. you know what do you what do you make of this phenomenon, and, and where do you think it's going? Or what do you, what do you think it's doing, like sociologically? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that it's. I think that there is a. I don't have an answer to that question, but it is a question that I have that 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 I think about, that I try to think about quite a bit, which is this sort of um, the rise of the professional managerial class and what it's doing to democracy, because in my mind, democracy is this very messy pro process. I believe in democracy. I think it's the you know the, the highly imperfect system, which is the best one that we'll ever have. Um, but democracy. He, the, 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 you know, the, the, the sort of the media crowd that's constantly invoking the, the death of democracy at the hands of the Trumpists, um, in many ways are the most undemocratic people there are because they're constantly trying to, to, to block this faction, which I don't know, you know, I'm no fan of Trump. I don't agree with those voters, but they are, but they have a right to have their points of view in a democratic society. Um, and so like, I, I do think that there's this sort of like, there's this rise, there's this new ruling class that has emerged. It's no longer a, a, a capitalist class. It's a, the capitalists are part of it, but it's this managerial class. And democracy is not the most um, useful sort of form of government for that ruling class. Ironically, you can say that democracy was the most useful for the capitalist class at the time that that capitalists were undisputedly running things. 
And that's not to say the capitalists were like some enlightened bunch of like, you know, good hearted people who wanted to give everybody a voice, but in a complex, in a society with a complex division of labor, everybody had some, this is very Durkheimian, everybody has some power, even if you're just making widgets, right? Because the economy can't work without your labor power combined with everybody else's. And so you have, the system has to grant you some political autonomy the system you are able to make demands on the system in a way that a serf was not able to because you can do things like organize unions and go on strike so a democracy was a way in which you could contain which you, you could essentially like um cat um in uh sort of appease every part of the economy that was necessary for the economy to function so that's still the case um but we are we have a more bifurcated economy than we used to, and the and it's very top heavy um, with this managerial class. So I feel like things are this is this this might sound half baked because it is. I haven't thought all this stuff through, but I do believe that there is a, a sort of a, a drift towards technocracy that we're experiencing right now, which is a much more um, conducive form of of public administration for the professional managerial class than democracy is. And let's let's just un unpack a couple terms here to make it crystal clear for people who who haven't uh, been exposed to them before. You talked about technocracy and you keep talking about this professional managerial class. So so mm -hmm. what exactly are those two things? So the professional managerial class, I think the best way to describe it is the way that James Burnham, who wrote about um, this class, and he wrote about it with the, he called it the, the just the managerial class. Um, but he wrote a book in the in the 19, 1941, um, making a lot of predictions which did not come to pass, but which now seem um, more relevant than they've been since the time that he wrote the book. Um, so there's there's like the you know. Back in the 19th century, you had the owning class, you had the the, the the capitalists, and you had the proletariat, right? Then from a sort of Marxist point of view, which I subscribe to, I think that Marx had the right analysis for 19th century capitalism. Um, you had one set of class interests that the workers had, and one set of class interests that the owners had, and those were uh, irreconcilably opposed to one another, and you had class struggle emerge from that. But we live in a different capitalism now. In the in the over the course of the 20th century with Fordism and with the expansion of the federal government and with a whole bunch of changes that, that came along with, with the advancement of technology, you had this massive new class, which was neither worker nor owner, right? They didn't own the means of production. They didn't own the companies outright. They didn't own the, 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 their offices, the buildings, the, their desks, their equipment. In that sense, they were like workers, right? When you come to work, you don't own the equipment that you use. The owner owns the equipment. It's, you're just using it the same way you come to work, work as a white collar worker and you, you don't own the office, you don't own the desk and the computer. Um, but you're so in that way, you're like a worker, but you're not like a worker, right? Because you're control because you do control the means of production, even if you don't own them, right? Mm -hmm. Without without the technicians, without these these people with a, a very high degree of expertise, and that's everybody from like scientific expertise to to managers, like people managers. Yeah, yeah. People know how to manage a bureaucracy. Yeah. With, or, without, I guess I mean it even goes back to your example of like the software engineers at the New York Times making the app. Right. They don't own the New York Times like a capitalist owned, you know, a factory in 1850, but they literally control like how the thing works and right. they have a disproportionate say in like how it's going to function. Right. And unlike the proletarians, you know, like when you had these simple machines, if they go on strike, they have to do a sit down strike really to be able to prevent you from replacing them because they go on or strike you strike, you hire replacement workers because anybody can, uh, can do your job right in the 19th century with these, these factories, anybody could do that job. Um, Whereas with with these guys, you know, yet not anybody can run the New York Times app. Very few people can run the New York Times app, and and also very few people can run uh, a bureaucracy of like five hundred people. You know, th that takes a lot of skill to have the management skills to be able to know how to organize workflow and all these things that that it's easy to make fun of as being superfluous jobs, but they're actually highly technical highly specific like jobs that that these companies would not be able to operate without the without those people doing those jobs so you have this big tier and this also includes government workers and it includes the creative class people and it includes um you know um, academics there's all these people who just do not fit into workers for vote versus owners who don't own the means of production but they do control the means of production as a matter of fact control them more than those who we used to call the capitalists 
because like now, like who owns a publicly traded company, right? Like 10,000 stock individual stockholders, a bunch of sovereign wealth funds, some, uh, you know, some some pension funds or whatever. These aren't like there's it's not like it used to be with a guy in a top hat and a monocle who owns the company. It's divided up into all these these different institutions and those institutions themselves are run by PMCs, right? Like if you go to a hedge fund or you go to a, a, a pension fund, you know, most of the people who are staffing it belong to the professional managerial class. So who really controls the means of production in the United States? Who really own, even owns the means of production in the United States? The professional managerial class, which is sort of a fusion between what Marx viewed as the capitalist class and this new set of professionals who Marx couldn't even, even ever imagined. Um, so that's what I call together the professional managerial class and it's like everybody who, if you've been, if you graduated from a four year university and you're in one of these jobs like media or, um, or, you know, um, tech or something, it's pretty much everybody you know, you know, everybody you work with certainly, probably a lot of people in your family and probably most of your friends um, belong to that class. And that is, and, and, and that class is, is, you know, a distinct minority within America. Um, uh, most people are working class. Most people didn't go to college. Yeah, but it strikes me that it probably doesn't feel that way to people within the class. So no. nominally, at least, I'm I'm a part of that class. Like I, I have a highly advanced uh, degree. I have a lot of technical skills. I deploy them inside of a private company um, mm -hmm. that's very technical in nature in terms of what we do. Um, and everyone in my immediate life uh, my friends, uh, my coworkers and stuff, it sort of feels like everyone, that's just what everyone does. But of course right. the, the vast majority of Americans aren't in the bubble that I'm in. There's a book, um, that was recommended to me and that I read and enjoyed by a totally, uh, uh, like a persona non grata author, which was Charles Murray who co-wrote the bell, the bell curve. So, um, you know, it takes some, some, some boldness for me to even admit I read the book, uh, but, uh, I actually don't care. Um, the it's an excellent book um it's called coming apart and it's about he looks at white america and the reason why he looks at white america specifically is because he wanted to basically control for the variable of race and look purely at class so he's like he didn't want to look at all of america because then you have to he does return to to to, to everybody else at the end but he's like okay let's look at what's happening to people who cannot say that this is because of racial discrimination or you know like it's it's just white white people and he and he paints a very compelling portrait of a radically bifurcated america in which um so like he talks about um these things called that he calls super zips which are these zip code corridors in which um in which like these are contiguous areas of like contiguous zip zip codes wherein like basically like 90% of the people within those of residents within those zip codes have four year college degrees. And, um, and then there's these vast oceans of, of zip codes where nobody does. And so if you live in one of these super zips and, and more and more of America have become divided between super zips and non super zips. Um, if you live in one of these super zips, you like you, you like you, the most, the most if you go to a target, you're going to interact with a retail worker. But other than that, you will never like your name, none of your neighbors, nobody at your church, if you still go to church, um, you know, nobody at your kids swim class, nobody in your in your geographical area is not like you. So yeah, if you live in that world, you're 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 going to have the impression that this is what America is. And then when people start voting a different way, um, when people you know, who you've never uh, you know, interacted with, um, who your kids don't go to school with, start voting in a way that um, that you think is is, um, is sacrilegious, then it's like the barbarians at the gate, right? It's like we're surrounded by all these these these, these brutish monsters who are voting for Donald Trump. Um, so you know that class divide is a it's a cultural divide, um, but it's like an existential cultural divide. And you know. In many ways, what we've been talking about, what a lot of people have been talking about recently, um, I mean, for a number of years now, is is this general idea of decline, of mm -hmm. civilizational decline. And, you know, the way that I start to think about this is, you know, we know that organisms are mortal, right? We grow, we stagnate, we age, we die. Mm -hmm. um, all organisms will decay. Um, all companies will decay. I had a really interesting guest named Jeffrey West 
who wrote a book called Scale, which is all about you know comparing how organisms, cities, and companies grow and scale, and then oh, in wow. some case in some cases decline. And basically, what he says is you know organisms, uh, companies are like organisms; they're mortal. So mm-hmm. their internal dynamics are such that you know they can't live forever. Right. Cities, on the other hand, can. So just to take some trivial examples, like you know Hiroshima is still here. Right. You can drop a nuclear bomb on a city, and the city will come back. Um, but of course, that's distinct from from the culture or the civilization that is infusing the city. And he doesn't talk about that in his book, but it seems to me like right cultures and civilizations are more like organisms than cities themselves right they mm-hmm. they have a time course like right rome eventually ended ancient egypt isn't with us anymore like cultures cu- cultures and societies bloom they reach various crises points and then they then they decline so you know our are we right now in the West broadly in the US specifically, are we in such a state of decline? And is that an inevitable thing that we just have to go through? Or can we kind of reverse it? I mean, I think we're in a decline. And I would also say that, you know, America kind of cuts against his examples. And I'm I'm sure he probably accounts for this in his theory. But like, you know, we do see dying cities in America, right? Um, um, cities that were dependent upon industrial manufacturing, um, which are just like ghost towns now. Um, and uh, but I think that we're in a period of decadence in the United States. Um, I think that we're in a period of in which you know we have a highly sort of privileged class ruling class which is completely out of touch maybe more than ever before with um most of the country with the people with the population of most of the country you know even the capitalists you know the top hatted monocled capitalists of marxist times time were like you know in their factories presumably like managing their workforces and interacting with um, the working class. Um, whereas, you know, unless you live in a city like New York, um, you're, if you if you belong to the PMC, there's a good chance that you're never having those interactions at all. So I think that we're living in, a, in, I think that's a very, very dangerous situation for a polity to be in, for a democratic society to be in. Um, and, um, and I, but I think the people in that ruling class are going to be fine, right? They're like, it's a very, cosmopolitan class it's the kind of people who can get up and move to london anytime you know if they, if they if, if things get bad enough here um they'll be fine but the people in the rest of the country um uh, not so fine um I, I i don't want to predict where that'll be going i am reading a book right now called um by peter zeitlin called the and the end of the world is just the beginning or something like that which addresses exactly this question but i'm not very far into it i'm just a couple of chapters into it so what was um so Durkheim had this this concept of anime, and it ties into some of the things that we we touched on to do with, you know, social order and having you know moral coherence among a group, and you know when certain things break down, the whole sort of um, you know you enter into like a, a state of decline and degradation in a society. So what was this concept of anime, and how does how does what we've been talking about sort of speak to that? Right, so Durkheim wrote this essay called Suicide, um, which was his sort of uh, earliest, most like sort of foundational work, um, because it set the stage for the argument that he was making, which is he made throughout his career, which is that um, society is an entity sui generis, which me- meaning that society is not just the sum total of individuals. Society has a reality which is separate and apart from our reality as individuals, and therefore it, de- it deserves its own field of study, which is sociology. Um, so in suicide, he looked at um, the uh, the incidence of suicide, I think it was in Paris, um, among Protestants versus Catholics, and found a distinct difference between basically Protestants were far more likely to kill themselves than Catholics, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, he he uh, attributed to, to um, Protestants are much, much more likely to worship alone. And, um, and it's much less centered upon the congregation. Um, they were much more, they, they, they tended to be more isolated from one another. So from that, he kind of extrapolated this theory of like social enemy, where when you don't have what's you know what a lot of sociologists call social capital, Bourdieu wrote about social capital as well, but he wrote about it in a different way than like um, writers like Robert Putnam, who's who's very famous for writing about social capital, write about social capital. But sort of the conventional American way of looking at social capital is is um, the is things like you know 
baseball teams and bowling leagues and churches and the things that bring us together. So a, the social capital is something that's community communally held. So like within a community, a community that's high in social capital is a community that has a lot of institutions that bring people together. Um, and we've been losing, and everybody understands, like everybody's looked at this agrees that we've been losing social capital for the past hundred years. Um, we live lives entirely separate from each other. There is one big sort of variable which needs to be accounted for, which is the internet, which is brought, which has divided us and brought us together in different ways. So that complicates the picture, but people aren't joining voluntary societies anymore. And as we become more isolated from each other, there's a consequence to socially to us collectively. There's um there's a deterioration of the social fabric, and um and and we experience it on a personal level. Like people get depressed, um and a physical level, people start to develop you know um, medical conditions that they didn't used to have, um because of their reactions to emotional stress and things like that, you know diabetes stuff like that, um and uh, and so that's all part of anime. Um and uh, I think. You know, there's a good case for for taking a look at what's happening in the city of San Francisco, because certainly the 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 chaos and lawlessness which people are exposed to every day, at, at least see it every day, um, has you know uh, has psychological effects. Um, for one thing, people probably spend a lot more time locked up in their homes, you know, um, because it feels unsafe to go outside, particip participate less in public life. There's there's public spaces which people don't go to anymore because they've been taken over by tent encampments. Um, so, you know, my expectation would be that if you could measure the um, social solidarity um, and the social capital from like 30 years ago to today in San Francisco, you probably see a pretty precipitous drop off, like more so than the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And are you, um, you're a parent, is that accurate? I'm a parent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have so, a -year -old. you know, with your perspective, being a parent, how do you think, um, you know, things like parenting and fertility rates and, and demographic shifts play into to this, this notion of civilizational decline or anime? Um, you know, when you look at the fact that we have an aging population, um, that needs to be supported in the ways that, that older people inevitably will need to be supported. When you think about like the, I think quite strong drop in fertility rates that we're seeing in the mm -hmm. US and elsewhere. How do you think that ties into the trajectory we're on as a society? Yeah, well, it's funny because when I grew up, everybody was freaking out about overpopulation, which is like an, uh, uh, the, 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 the social sort of um, conditions for that concern rising up could fill an entire other podcast because a lot of it has to do in my opinion, with misanthropy, and a lot of it gave rise to um, to um, elements of the alt right. Um, but uh, but the um, but you know everybody's freaking out about overpopulation, and now of course we're in a reality in which you know most of the the advanced capitalist world is well below replacement level in terms of fertility. Um, Europe is below replacement level. Japan is way below replacement level, famous for it. And America has been below replacement level. And the main reason why it hasn't really impacted us in the way that it's impacting Europe is because of our immigration policies. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, by the way, you know, quite pro-immigration, um, even though I want to see all these Honduran drug dealers in San Francisco deported right away. Um, on generally on immigration, I'm, I'm, very, I'm quite liberal. I think that immigration has saved the United States in a way that it hasn't with Europe because we are, we, because we do have such a low replace, uh, low fertility level. So I think that's going to catch up. You can't fill backstop it with immigration forever. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and if you do, if you attempt to, then there's all sorts of other, you know, ancillary consequences that come along with it, not all of which are good. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a big problem. It's not when I have any sort of expertise in or anything particularly insightful to offer, but, you know, I think you look at Japan and you see, you know, um, 10 years into the future of the United States and it's not good. And so um, I don't think we mentioned up front, but you run a sub stack. Um, I, I read your articles fairly frequently. It's one of my favorite sub stacks. Thank you. Can you uh, point people to that, but also maybe just kind of summarize, like, what do you think you, you, you write about a lot of different subjects um, and there's a lot of richness there, but there does seem to be kind of like overarching themes to what you're interested in, what you write about. So how would you summarize that for people? Yeah. So my substack is leightonwoodhouse.substack.com. And since my first name is is uh, difficult to spell, I'll just spell it, which is L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N, 
Woodhouse is just how it sounds. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I don't, so the big themes that I write about in my Substack are number one, I, I, I report quite a bit about crime and drugs. Um, and so some of that makes it into my Substack. It's not every week, but it's, um, it's, you know, a consistent theme. Um, and then I write a lot about the professional managerial class, which we've described today. I write a lot about social theory. So I've read from, you know, Weber to Bourdieu to Durkheim. Marx, um, et cetera. I, I try to factor, or I, I just, I guess I'm naturally inclined to factor a lot of that into my, into my writing. Um, but you know, I, I, and I'm not sure what brings those two threads together. Um, I don't know if there is a thread to bring those two things together, but I, ha it has occurred to me that I tend to write about the elite. And then I tend to write about the least elite, which is like, you know, what, what, Marx called the lumpen proletariat, right? The drug users, um, people who are truly marginalized from society, um, you know, homeless street addicts. Um, and, uh, and I think that there's, a, I, I don't know that I could describe persuasively what exactly what ties those two themes together, but I think that they both tell a story about America. Um, I think that they both, um, I think that they both have dark implications for the future of this country. The fact that this, you know, this population of of homeless drug addicts is growing and growing and is subsuming more and more of our cities and more people are falling into that category, you know, middle class kids like it used to be that, you know, it was people who lived lives of lots of trauma who would fall into to addiction. But now the drugs have become so powerful that you can make one mistake, the kind of mistakes I used to make all the time as a teenager, you know, um, you order uh, Xanax on Snapchat just to fuck around, you know, and you get fentanyl. In, 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 and, uh, and you end up hooked on fentanyl. Like you can come from a very stable background with no trauma in your life and end up a homeless street addict. That, like that's happening. So there's also, also that phenomenon. So you have that sort of um, reality in America growing. And then at the same time, you have this like highly, increasingly intolerant, in my opinion, like politically and socially and culturally intolerant ruling class emerging which believes itself to be so virtuous that it thinks of itself as the saviors of democracy. But I think that they, that there are cultural instincts among that class that pose severe hazards to democratic society. So those are some various kind of um, uh, threads that I try to weave together. What's something that makes you feel optimistic or potentially optimistic about the future? Is there anything going on yeah. culturally that, that gives you that sense of optimism? I think I was much more cynical before I started to hang out and collaborate with Michael Schellenberger, um, who, you know, is persona non grata among a certain faction of, of the left because he's um, been willing to buck a lot of orthodoxies. Um, but uh, but the, the irony is that his vision for the world, which he ba backs up with his research, is far more optimistic than you know than the conventional views on the left like you know he wrote a book about climate change his background is in is in environmental activism and in uh and specifically in energy policy and he's a big booster of nuclear nuclear energy and you know he debunked a lot of the doom and gloom stories about climate change I do think climate change is real, and I do think that climate change is a profound threat. It does concern me, um, but I but I also think that there's a messianic sort of um, uh, a vibe within the left that there's some sort of like weird eroticism about the end of the world that people are, are like romantically attracted to, um, and uh, and I, a lot of that factors into climate change. It's, and it, there's the same kind of instinct that factored into the idea that we were going to overpopulate the planet and that the planet was was going to reach its carrying capacity by like, you know, 1998 or something and 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 fall into oblivion. And of course, that didn't happen. Um, when you look at the actual facts, you know, some of these 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 dystopian fairy fairy tales start to fall apart at the seams when you look at like the 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 um, the promise of nuclear power. Which has become started to become destigmatized even on the left in recent months, really. Um, 
when you look at like um, liquid natural gas and how it's not actually like how it is, it is a, a, a practical bridging technology to um, to other to cleaner energies and it's far cleaner than fossil fuels. You start to see these stupid decisions being made around like Germany cutting off, shutting down its nuclear power and then now getting cut off from nuclear from from liquid natural gas from from Russia. So now they're, they're turning back to fossil fuels. So you start to sort of see these boneheaded policies that make you more depressed about the future. But when you see the material possibilities of smarter decisions that could be made, that makes me a lot more optimistic. Like, I don't think that the I think that the the the, the most dystopian um threats that we face are not the ones that most people are looking at i think that there are things like the cultural divides that we have the um like social enemy um the 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 uh, you know, countries becoming more isolated from one another um there's like all these so, sort of social sociological uh indices which are going in the wrong direction and I'm very concerned about those. I will throw in one thing that I think gets probably not enough play just because I read a book about it, but um, which you might know more than I do because this gets into the natural sciences. Um, but uh, but after reading and uh, listening to an episode of Rogan, I read uh, Shania Swan, I think is her name, um, her book about flaylates and about the microplastics and how they're um, basically making us all infertile. And it was pretty persuasive. And I was like, holy shit, if this is true, like never mind climate change like yeah we'll go extinct as a species within a couple of generations yeah i'm not a super expert in that area but i feel reasonably confident in saying that yeah what you know for lack of a better term what modernity has done among other things is polluted our ingestive environment we're literally mm -hmm. consuming into our bodies knowingly and unknowingly through food and literally through our skin and other things many things which are just mucking with us and our endocrinology and other aspects of our biology and i think it's it is having very real consequences for people's physical health and their psychology yeah the 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 anogenital distance the taint has been like getting smaller and smaller generation to generation and by the way it's not just humans it's happening in all types of animals and as they and as that distance has gotten smaller they've become less and less fertile it's really scary stuff but you know I'm 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 also I'm skeptical about any sort of like uh, uh, claims to you know the end of the the end of civilization the end of I, I'm very open to arguments about the slow decline of civilization and somehow more skeptical about these ideas of these sudden like cliffs that were that were inevitably going to fall over just because I think that there's so much glory in writing about that stuff and there's so much of a, a weird emotional appeal to to those kinds of visions that i that i that i'm like okay what's at work here is it is this real or is this like fulfilling some weird psychic need yeah and um you know one last thing i want to ask you about is just you know as as a writer as a journalist um you've chosen the substack route as many uh many people have an increasing number over the last few years you know given the general uh, environment of journalism, you know, all the way from, you know, the New York Times and sort of the classic journalistic institutions to the independent writing that's happening on Substack. What made you go to Substack? How has that been going? And, mm -hmm. and what do you see there in terms of how uh, writing and writers and the dissemination of ideas and how that interfaces with tech? Uh, where do you see that going? Well, for myself, it's kind of funny. I'm kind of a loser, actually, when it comes to being a journalist, because, you know, uh, before I was before I did my Substack, you know, I was I've, I've been freelancing for many years, and uh, and I applied and applied and applied and applied and applied for staff positions at many different publications, and like uh, like I wasn't even getting interviews, um, and I don't know why. Like I consider myself a fairly a decent reporter, just to, like on basic journalism, um, but like uh, but like my going to Substack was not like a like like it was with say Glenn Greenwald, like a you know like a, a real triumphant move. It was more like I'll try this out because like, you know, it's another source of income and it's been very like, you know, I've had modest success with Substack. I'm not um, like, you know, uh, one of the top Substackers, but it's been uh, a, a significant part of my overall sort of income for portfolio. So it's been very that's more successful than I expected it to be. Um, and, but, uh, you know, I found since since that happened, like I'm, I'm sort of. I'm, I'm very, very glad that I never got those interviews um, because a because I really enjoy writing independently. Like now, writing freelance isn't just 
oh, sorry, writing freelance isn't just um, uh, uh, like a, a necessary, it's not just like my backup plan. It's like, I actually really enjoy that much more than if I was taking assignments from editors, but also because of the freedom that I have to explore all these really nerdy topics that I'm able to explore on Substack has been very fulfilling to me. So it's those two things in combination with the fact that the direction that the media has gone, I would be enormously unhappy if I was on the staff of say the New York times or the staff of even like, you know, The Intercept, who I used to um, uh, write for quite a bit, um, it would be absolutely miserable. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like one of the things I love about reading you and, and other people on Substack is that um, there's really two things. One, because it's independent writing, it's an individual not reporting to, you know, one or more editors and, and things like that. Um, you do get to explore these nerdy topics and sort of mm -hmm. it, it, it infuse stories with ideas and concepts that probably wouldn't get greenlighted at you know a traditional media outlet. Mm -hmm. um, and two, just that I know that it's an individual. So whether or not I agree with any particular thing that you say or that you're writing about, it's very clear that this is you know and it, it's a good piece of writing that's been edited and polished, but it's not fil going through the same filters right. that it would go through elsewhere. And you just you really do get the sense on Substack that you are hearing the sort of raw. Um, polished, but still raw thoughts of an individual human being. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about how Substack has kind of opened up avenues for people without with uh, unorthodox um, political views. And that's true. And that's been a big value that Substack has added to the world. But also just in terms of the nerdy stuff, like Razib Khan is a friend and um, and uh, one of my favorite Substacks. And, you know, he's able to write these like 10,000 word pieces about like the genetic origins of the Vikings and their like migration patterns into Russia in like the third century AD or whatever, well, actually probably much earlier than that. Um, and like these like, you know, and like he writes about that stuff all over the world, um, the, 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 the migration from Korea to Japan and like among like, you know, pr like primitive tribal hunter gathering peoples. And he like has an extremely successful sub stack. There's a lot of people reading it, myself included. And it's like, that stuff used to be relegated to academia and it was they were in inaccessible journals in in, in very obscure obscure academic language and as it turns out there's like there is a big readership for some pretty nerdy stuff um and i think that that is just intellectually a huge contribution that substack has made to the world all right well leighton woodhouse thank you for your time uh why don't you just tell everyone where your substack is once more just in case they missed it yeah, Leighton Woodhouse. So that's L E I G H T O N, LeightonWoodhouse.substack.com. And the Substack is called Social Studies. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks again. Thank you so much.